Yeah. Right, and let us open with a prayer in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother Amen. of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. 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 Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. There I am. Good to see you, Fra. Okay, so this week we are looking at <clears throat> chapter six of the Theologian of Auschwitz by Father Peter Fellner, published posthumously. Um, chapter six is the historical and doctrinal context. And just we talked a bit about the structure last. Um, last meeting, which, you know, you can find on YouTube. This is opening part three, the golden thread of Franciscan history, age of Mary and the Holy Spirit, where in this section, largely it's a detailing of the thesis of St. Maximilian about the golden thread, the, his, its roots within the Franciscan order, and trying to line up his analysis of the two pages of, of various points, it seems a bit with um, Bonavent Bonaventure, where it seems that this one's a bit Bonaventure, and then we look at SCOTUS in the next section on the will. Anyways, I with little further ado, I am going to share my screen and... We will begin. Am I sharing the presentation or is it still the uh, behind the scenes? It seems to be the presentation. Okay, that's wonderful. All right. So this is over pages 135 to 156. We, I prepared the first few, others looked at some others, and so correct, uh, working together, we should be able to do this. All right, so the general structure of the chapter is it's based on the first half of the 1933 circular to the Franciscan students that Colby wrote while he was on mission to Japan. This is, he breaks, well, Father Peter takes this and breaks it up into three parts. The cause of the Immaculate, the incorporation of the mystery in terms of the divine missions, and the role of penance, poverty, and transubstantiation into the Immaculate. Then that last chapter then opens the final section, which is the doctrinal backdrop, as the heading says for that particularly last, um, the last section there, again, looking at the Trinitarian basis of Marian mediation, the economic Trinity, and the Trinity ad intra and mediation. To touch on some of the concepts that we have already looked at um, in general over, oops. Over some of the previous meetings, the concept of evolution comes up. And in the Colbian context with his liking for taking scientific terms to use this as analogies, Evolution is the gradual development of, of something into um, a higher and higher form. But as Father Peter notes, this is not something that's happening from its own native powers that then through some process lead to greater complexity and sophistication, but rather 
This is based in Bonaventure's distinctions and what you could call the relative supernatural, where you have in creation, you have vestiges, which are non-personal creatures, you know, rocks, grass, dolphins. Um, then you have the, Good evening. Good evening, Sorry Father. Sorry for being late. Um, then, so then the image is the, uh, the created person, the image of Gautamagyo Dei. And in Bonaventure, this is noted by a special divine concursus that God cooperates in the existence, in the action of everything. But then in the created person, this goes up to a higher, this is a higher level, a relative supernatural, where this concursus or running with establishes personal identity, enlightening the intellect and inflaming the will, that is memory, intellect, and will, the distinctive powers of the creative per created person. That is, um, we can say I, we can know the truth, and we can love the good. But then there is another relative supernatural, which is from the gift of grace called the similitude. And this goes back to, as we know, Genesis, where it says, God created man in his image and likeness or image and similitude. And this level is that um, in an image, and the, the precise distinction uh, flees at the moment, but uh, the image is reflects God in a certain way, but the similitude is close to God. And that's the people who are persons who are raised in communion with God by grace in hope, faith, and charity, which then each of those build on hope builds on memory, faith on intellect and charity in the will. In the terms of C.S. Lewis, the similitude is um, in his book, Till We Have Faces, when he asks the question of why do, no, why do we not encounter God in our, in our human living? And he says, the reason is, is it's not because God is so um, elusive or not, um, it's not because he's not there, it's because we don't have faces. It's you can't have a conversation without a face. And the similitude is where God himself gives us a face capable of entering into communion with the Trinity. So each of these is a relative elevation from the previous, and they are worked by a higher agent or a hierarch in an act of hierarchization or putting in order, recapitulation. Evolution, so you can describe this in personal growth, like in our class, in the class I had on uh, personalism, that caused a problem with some when um, when the professor said that, you know, are you born a person or do you become a person? And so you, you can sort of bring both of these in where I'm created a human person, but that's not something that is already completed, that I have, it's in my humanity, my, I, I am entrusted to myself, and then I have to become a person, I have to become someone who's responsible, who's willing to, and able to enter into relations with others, to love, to be accountable in these various things. Um, and then so there's, you could say, personal growth, which is the, the natural development of the human person into a mature human person. But then grace with the similitude brings up a, another level, which is the growth in grace. And in these both of these senses, evolution is the unfolding of some already existent reality into its fullness. 
And so then there are the two points there, holiness and baptism, conquered and patience. The important thing here is evolution does not mean loss of identity, but gradual acquisition of its fullness. This also maps onto the identity of type in Newman's analysis of development, where something can change, but there is a hard inner reality that is not something that changes. The authentic development means fidelity to what is most central and being willing to change that which is peripheral. So then evolution towards archetype, and there are several different ways we can look at this here. We have in salvation history, we have the created word, creating word predestined, which is that God creates, the Father creates through Christ. And so creation in a way is already, the word is already present in the, in the uh, where is it, warp and wolf, in the very fabric of creation, the word and this is what it as exemplifying that the son expresses the father and then in creation created things express exemplify in their own particular way the divinity the divine trinity then you have adam created in the garden with eve and then the new Adam, which is the word incarnate. And so you have this general movement towards the goal. In the Franciscan order, as commented on by Benevent Bonaventure in his Collation 22, you have Francis, who is the seraphic saint. But then the friars minor themselves are the cherubim, along with the Dominicans. They are not at the same level of St. Francis. Whereas then he says, though, in the future, the order will become all that it had been intended to be. In the, again, in the person, we see this initially with identity and then through a life of growth into human maturity, then with the Christian, you have the sacraments of initiation. Then you have the, you know, the, the building of a vocation, the life of growth in grace to the point where we become who we were made to be in sanctity. But that is something that is um, we move towards, not something we already possess. To put this in another to place this into recapitulation and recirculation. You have, um, I should probably, this is, uh, I, I should have probably worked and made the appearance of things on the page to make easier the acquisition of the, uh, of the information. But anyways, you have here in humanity with Jesus and Mary, you have, Jesus and Mary here, and but there is a sort of a temporal start here with the Immaculate Conception, in which could be then in our place we're moving into that. So we are moving in here. We we're starting here in the order of intention. It starts here, but historically we're moving sort of this direction. So there's the Immaculate Conception of Mary, and then we enter into that by transubstantiation into Mary. Then charismatic, that is the living of the life of the Holy Spirit, the life of grace in our daily life. Um, as Matt Fred says, it's acting like Jesus is real or that Jesus is alive. And then that leads us towards what we could call transubstantiation into the Holy Spirit which is, again, this is a general movement where we're basically starting, we're basically following after where Mary already worked. As, as the Second Vatican Council says in Lumen Gentium 8, the church follows Mary's walk of faith. But then these two moments as well, Mary 
and the Holy Spirit come together at the Annunciation, well, through all her life, but in a particular way at the Annunciation, and you sort of go back here to the Incarnation, which is the, the work of the whole Trinity, of Mary, and of the Word who assumes the, the humanity that's created. And then in that, all is recapitulated or reheaded under Christ. And then he enters into the Paschal mystery, you could say carrying Adam and all of fallen humanity on his back until returning to the Father in the resurrection and ascension, and then the sending of the Holy Spirit, which takes us back to here. In place, putting this in another way, we can say that we start in the secular, and we've talked about this in some of the earlier classes, that there is a sort of neutral starting point that is neither yet fallen nor sanctified. Then through the sacraments, we're formed into the church, which then grows in holiness and elect or glorified or church triumphant here. So again, we have this sort of recirculation in these recapitulations where you have the secular that's then baptized in the church that then develops through the charismatic life into the elect. And when we take this vertically, we see you can talk about a transubstantiation in any of these where we have Eucharistic transubstantiation in sacraments, the transubstantiation of Mary into the Holy Spirit, that is the, the personal unity of the two to where one, she reflects the personality of the Holy Spirit in her own person. And then what you could call the transubstantiation of Mary, not into the Holy Spirit, but into the incarnate word where the human nature taken from her is united to the divine person of the word. And so you have sort of in a way this triple set sub transubstantiation with that word taken in, in analogical ways. You could, say, you could say the incarnational starting from the top, relational and sacramental. And again, here, these arrows here, again, all fall under recapitulation by the redemption and its fruits. So that's just sort of an excessively long introduction that is not done yet. Again, see, Adam falls, you have redemption, then recreation, and these are sort of recirculations with a reheading by Christ in the redemption and the recreation with the ultimate return of Christ and the glorification of the church. And the passage from the old to the new is Mary. And then we have here the drama, the conflict between the secularism which is not the secular, but which says the secular here is the same as this. And it says that what we have here is all we need, and there's nothing up here that's important. But we see, in contrast, that St. Francis, the son of Mary, called to rebuild the church according to the model of the Immaculate. Okay, so now we can look at the circular itself. And would somebody be willing to read? Well, I'm not. Yeah, if someone could try to read that, I hope that it'll stay if someone else starts talking. Or was somebody else? I can read it. Okay. Okay. Here, let me just try and minimize all your faces because you're covering the thing. There we go. Okay. All right. Every generation has to add its own hard work and the fruits of that effort to those of previous generations. The same very much happens in the life of a religious order and in ours as well. What will we be adding to it? It is said that the further a religious order is removed from its founder, the weaker it becomes. 
and that is what often happens. Yet it, not yet it need not necessarily be like that, for the spirit does not know the material laws of aging, but must evolve without limit. The germ he, St. Francis, placed in the order must evolve without limitation. From the dawn of our order for seven centuries, the golden thread of the cause of the Immaculata has constantly evolved. We fought for recognition of the truth of the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Our fight ended in victory. This truth is recognized worldwide and has been declared a dogma of faith. So then this is the, what Father Peter treats under the principle of the Immaculate, where the principle of growth is fidelity to the core. And now when fidelity to that wanes, to that when we were talking about the, uh, the hard core where the evolution of something makes more and more dynamic and present and real, um, when fidelity to that principle of, of growth wanes, you can say that the unity between the human and the spiritual breaks down with two effects. Those who emphasize the authentically human fall into laxity and abuses, whereas those who desire, you could say, to seek God react in an excess of zeal. And these are themes that return time and time again, often under the, the phrase of the love of learning which would be this right here, and the desire for God should be right here. This St. Francis mentions this in his famous letter to Anthony, where he says, yes, teach the friars theology, but do not let it take the place of prayer. And so this is part of the Christian life and Franciscan life is having authentic humanity and authentic spirituality together. But then what happens is when you have laxity on one side, you have the other react into where you have an unhuman, you have basically a fallen human, humanism and then an unhuman spiritualism. And this is a reoccurrent theme throughout the history of the church. Then, so with this unity, with lax uniform, splitting over poverty and its common observances which the Franciscans are known for their various splits. Okay, so would someone else want to read the second part of the circular? Yeah, I can try, but my English is not very well, so. All right, well, it's on the screen, so. That's okay. And now, as the chaos, that chaos possibly come to an end, could we be content just with drawing the plan of a house without ever trying to carry it out? Rather, is, is it not true that the plan is laid out only because it is a prerequisite for building the house itself? There opens the second page of our history then, namely, to sow that truth into the hearts of all those who live and will live until the end of time and to ensure that growth and the fruits of sanctification to introduce the Immaculata into the hearts of men so that they, she may erect in them the throne of a son, lead them to the knowledge of him and inflame them with love toward his most sacred heart so this here is what father peter calls the incorporation of the mystery in the divine missions um, when we speak of missions we mean the father sending the son and the spirit into creation and what we don't mean is um that so, uh, anyways, um, that's for Mission Impossible in case some of, in case anyone has not seen that, that movie. So the missions, 
are the sendings, which is what mission means, of the Son and the Spirit into creation. The, just to define the term, then the proclamation of the dogma of the Immaculate Conception in 1984 coincides with the fall of Christendom, with the French Revolution and the revolutions all throughout that marked most dramatically by the fall of the papal states in central Italy during the reunification of Italy, two forces, the secularizing forces, and that happened pretty much at the same time as this. In fact, one reason why there wasn't a, one of the novelties of the Immaculate Conception, the proclamation is the Pope defined the dogma basically by a document or by himself, not in the context of a ecumenical council. Rather, there was a council by letter where the bishops of the world were asked if they wished, if they thought this was good to define. And then the Holy Father, Pius IX, by his own papal authority, did that. And that was important, too, because it placed the centrality of the papacy in, um, it underlined the centrality of the papacy in his ability to do that against the other theological trends of the time, such as Gallicanism, or uh, basically national churches basically doing their own thing with the Pope as a figurehead, where this said, no, the Pope is the spiritual head and unifying principle in the church. Um, and then, so you see this proclamation of the dogma as you move from sort of the European institutional Christianity to a global church that does not coincide with the nation states of Europe or of the, uh, yeah, that, um, and so then you, this then bears full fruit in the Second Vatican Council with its emphasis on the church as missionary and communion slash community or people of God. <coughs> because again, you move from basically being a Christian civilization to being a community within a secular civilization. And that is the opening of the second page where now we have, with the Immaculate Conception, we have the model for the church. And now we need to incorporate that model into the church. And this is what, you know, we've talked in the past about the Marian and the Petrine principle and the primacy of the Marian, which historically you might be able to see in the proclamation of the dogma, dogma of the Immaculate Conception in, 1950, in 1854, followed um, several years later by the First Vatican Council and the proclamation of papal infallibility. So there you have, again, Mary and Peter, but Mary in her immaculateness precedes Peter and makes possible that this, you could say, as, as Jonathan Peugeot says, the feminist is the space within which the hierarchy is able to exist. And because Father Peter notes that St. Maximilian's program is not just Marian devotion, which he says many people think it is, but rather Mary is the meeting place of the missions of the Spirit and the Son in creation. Through the power of the Spirit, she becomes the mother of the Son. And then, the, so again, this forms the basic paradigm of Christianity that Mary, prepared by the Holy Spirit, receives the word of the angel into her, you could say, good soil, and bears fruit by the Spirit, and the fruit being Christ. And then this repeats in the life of every person, that is, the action of the Holy Spirit preparing, the coming of the word, the reception of the word, and the bearing of the fruit. And so this is why it's like St. Maximilian will say, not transform us into Christ, but transform us, you know, his prayer to Mary is not that she transform us into Christ, but rather that she transform us into herself, 
meaning that we enter into that same paradigm of her immaculate conception and then bearing Christ in our own life. So we, just like, um, in a way, we all we all bear, Adam and Eve are, you know, not to get into the, that whole discussion of historicity and, and what is the first chapters of Genesis mean, but they're also s- symbolic of humanity as a whole, both Adam for men and Eve for women, but also each as sort of, you could say, the masculine and the feminine in every human person, masculine aspects, feminine aspects, um, the more, you could say, rational, the more sensate. Um, And so likewise, there's a, a reproduction of this as well, where we all are fashioned according to the model of Mary and then transformed into Christ. And that, again, points us back into this central point here where there's this transubstantiation into Mary, into the Holy Spirit, which precedes the incarnation, recapitulating under Christ, going through the cross to the Father. Then there are are three points. He mentions under uh, the incorporation of the mystery in terms of the divine missions. And I'll just brush on the first one here, and then we can open it up for discussion since I've been talking for a considerable amount of time. So mediation in the Trinity, where before we talk about mediation outside of the Trinity, that is Christ, the sole mediator between God and man, Mary, our mediator before Jesus, and the Holy Spirit in encompassing that whole thing, that whole process occurring within the Holy Spirit. First, we have to look at the Trinity itself, because there is mediation in the Trinity, because mediation is to bring two extremes into unity. And in the Trinity, in this first image here, The extremes are the Father, who is unbegotten, who is the font of plenitude, who is, you know, um, like that's his personal characteristic, is he is not from another. Whereas the Holy Spirit does not proceed another. There's no other divine person who comes out of the Holy Spirit, but rather he is the fruit of the Father and the Son. So you have the Father who generates the Son, who then both as from one principle, as you can see here over on the other side, as one principle, from one principle, the Holy Spirit proceeds and is the extreme part here that he is the one who comes from but from whom no one comes. And the son here is the mediator between the two. He is the one who both is originated and originates. He is the one who both uh, receives love and gives love in the sense of love is... uh, communicating the divine nature. Um, So then you can, the Holy Spirit there in the second moment has a mediating proper to himself where he doesn't mediate between one person to another. He's not the son in the middle. He's the complement, the fulfillment, the fullness But at the same time, there is a mediating associated with him, which is both the gift or donum of the divine nature from the father to the son, and then from the return of that from the son to the father, and also the nexus or bond of the love between the two. And so in a way, you can say that, yes, there's no mediation that the spirit works 
But at the same point, as as the end point of the divine gen, divine uh, processions, in a way, it's the motive force for the generation that the father, in knowing himself and loving himself, in lovingly knowing himself, gives the divine nature or communicates is a better communicates the divine nature to the son. But in that there's already that presence of love of, of union of um, it's moving towards completion. And so this is to say that um, there is a mediation, a mediator between the extremes but there's also a mediating of the Holy Spirit that takes the whole uh, process of the divine processions within the Holy Trinity towards their completion. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we'll move into discussion. And then I think I stole, we moved to trying to do this, uh, this way of, assigning pages just in the past few days and so i assigned pages at the last moment and i've already stolen some pages from another and so we'll see if there was time to look at things beforehand or if we're just going to talk about that stuff thank you brother it was very clear and um I love your point when you were saying international or relational sacramental. So it's kind of where you link the identity, then the relationship or relational in the person, and then the sacramental life of the church. So the presence of the Holy Spirit in the sacrament. So it was very, yeah. And then another point, and you said, Mary reflect the personality of the Holy Spirit in his own person. So uh, that made me uh, think about one, one point is that, yeah, maybe the personality, but even in the body, the body and soul of Mary. So the presence of the Holy Spirit is not something only spiritual or maybe only in the soul, 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 yeah. It's something linked with the body. And I would say that it's perfectly Scottist as a point because at the moment of the incarnation, then the Virgin Mary received the grace of being active in the incarnation and receiving in her body the capacity of generating in the matter, in the matter, the body of Christ, which is the body of God. So here there is a positivity of the Franciscan vision, which come from the uh, Irish or maybe Scottish uh, or Celtic view, which is a positive view on the matter. And which say that the matter is something not in the negative sense of the, the word, but it's something positive for the will, uh, for the, for the, in the creation. And so you can link that with the Holy Spirit. So if the Holy Spirit is the creator, is a vivificator, or we could say is the living person of the Trinity, which creates everything, then you have in Mary the perfect image so that she's able by the Holy Spirit of creating the most perfect person that could be created, that is Jesus Christ. So it's very linked with the Franciscan spirituality. And yeah, I would like uh, to make that point. Uh, to explain that, okay, thank you. Maybe to to give some precision, I think to the language instead of create, maybe the, the best term would be communicate nature in the sense of, um, because the parents don't create the child, it's God who creates the child through their Cooperation. They communicate their humanity to the child, but God creates the soul directly. And so, but in that communication, I, I just wanted to, to, to precise that because in the Trinity, 
also in the Trinity, the Father doesn't create the Son, but he communicates the divine nature to the Son, which the Son has as his own nature. And so I just want to, to, to mention that, where, again, this gets into the definition of the person as being a uncommunicable existence of a created of a intellectual nature and so then the side of the nature there you have the possibility for communication where this the incommunicable side you could say makes the possibility for communicators so you have again that play between the incommunicable and the communicable or you could say he mentions in the in the text in the created human person, since we're not created in that, we don't have that same relationality as the persons of the Holy Trinity. We have our identity, which is in a way and a solitude. And then we have to go out from that solitude in communion. But again, there's that still, still dying, there's that same demonic. I am myself, and I'm not just myself because of my relations with others, but that being myself and I. So I can say I without having to say you, but at the same time to be able to realize the what it means to be a person, I have to both be able to say I and you. I think. Yeah. Ultimately, ultimately to be. Uh, a we or a, or a communion. <clears throat> I think another term that's helpful going back to um, the analogy um, or the relationship between the Holy Spirit and Mary, um, one, one could use the term also in uh, human generation, uh, procreation, uh, rather than creation as such, because there is a true um, secondary causal activity uh, that the parents um, undertake in um, bringing forth a child that is creative, but it's not creative in uh, primary act, it's created in secondary act, and so we call that procreation, um, and especially with respect to the um, the reality of the created soul, uh, there's been debate throughout church history on just how the soul comes to be in uh, human generation, but uh, the, the consensus um, now uh, especially from the uh, high middle ages, Thomas Scotus Aquinas, uh, I mean, Bonaventure is uh, that the Lord or the God, the Trinity directly and immediately creates the soul at the moment of uh, conception. And then that soul is infused. So um, because the parents are um, providing material aspects, positive, uh, <clears throat> nevertheless, uh, still physical, there is uh, the impossibility of creating a truly spiritual substance or form. And so that, that uh, theologians have now uh, commonly affirmed is created directly. So that's the creationist position with respect to the human soul. And so um, this is where that term communication and procreation become very important because the parents by themselves are not sufficient to explain the, um, the termination of the act of human generation insofar as they cannot produce a spiritual substance um, or a spiritual form, God directly creates that. So by the same uh, token, um, Mary through her fiat and her active cooperation, her active fiat with um, respect to the message of the angel through the power of, of the Holy Spirit, she does um, give consent that the human, the created uh, human nature of our Lord be brought about or be brought to term through her, through her maternal mediation and through her natural powers of generation, however um, hierarchized and activated by a higher principle. But at that same moment that the Holy Spirit is acting upon her um, maternal um, nature, he is the, 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 the Trinity as a whole is creating the human soul and infusing that human soul directly into that body that was formed uh, in the womb of Mary by the cooperation, the, the, the essentially ordered co-causality of the Holy Spirit or the causality appropriated to the Holy Spirit and Our Lady's natural um, uh, maternal generative powers. And so I think um, it's, it's helpful to uh, bring those points of clarification. And what, what, uh, Father uh, 
Joseph Peel brought up about the um, analogy between our, the, the Holy Spirit and Mary is, is quite correct. Um, just as an aside, beyond just the, the positivity of uh, matter, and I had never considered it in terms of uh, particular ethnic uh, dispositions, um, English, Scottish, Celtic, that, those, those questions, uh, but you may be, may be onto something there. Uh, one thing that, that is important in both uh, St. Bonaventure and then also in Duns Scotus, you find uh, in St. Bonaventure an application of the Augustinian notion of matter as containing the um, seminal reasons, the, the, the objective disposition to be diversified and differentiated into different kinds of animals or species, different kinds of things, I should say, um, through an active agent uh, a hierarchy, a hierarchizing agent that acts upon those and then in a sense educes or draws out uh, those forms. And again, there's a kind of mediatory um, aspect because matter is a term of creation, right? But it also it mediates to the full manifestation and differentiation of creation as such insofar as there are different types of creatures. And so this, this material component has a mediatory component, but it also has a positive component because it's waiting or disposed actively, although it can't act on its own, um, it's disposed towards uh, this further differentiation and identification, a full manifestation of different kinds of things. Uh, so that's, that's um, and that's basically, a Stoic idea that was taken up by Augustine and then um, commented upon at great length in book two of Bonaventure's commentary on the sentences. And uh, Scotus does things a little bit different. Um, you might find an analogy, and Father Peter draws this analogy, between the, uh, the seminal reasons in uh, Augustine and Bonaventure and Scotus's notion of the common nature, rather than the universal as concept or the particular um, in terms of the individual of a diff of a certain kind, he has this notion of a common nature that um, is objective, and it's not merely a concept, but it's it's not it's not it's not universal, and it's it's neither universal nor singular. It just simply is whatever the um, it is the nature of whatever kind of uh, entity you're considering. So, uh, with he uses the example of hoarseness uh, or um, being a horse. And he says, the common nature of horseness is just simply horse. It's neither one nor many. It's just horseness considered as horse. And this is something <clears throat> that is objectively in the world, but it's not uh, reified in a kind of um, platonic uh, distinction. It's, it's in a sense more like a principle um, a principle that functions similarly to the rational or the seminal reasons in Bonaventure's account of matter. It's a principle that's objective, that explains the potential for um, both the forming an abstract universal concept, but also for the instantiation of a particular individual of a certain kind. <clears throat> and so uh, a long way of saying uh, a, a really short response in reply to uh, the earlier comment about the positivity of matter is that Scotus then uses his notion of, co of common nature in conjunction with his understanding of matter as such, which is entirely positive. So he says matter is not simply a nothing or a pure potency. And in this, both he and Bonaventure differ from Aristotle and ultimately differ from uh, St. Thomas because they both view matter as something that is not mere potency, but something that has a certain act in itself and its act is to be in potency to other perfecting forms, but it's not simply an, a nil. So there, it's so for Scotus, he would say it is possible for matter to exist without form, even if uh, that actually never took place. And what he's making a point, he's making a point about the ontological constitution of the material component of the created order. Um, uh, you know, one thing I, I wanted to uh, just comment briefly on uh, Fra Charles's presentation back to this notion of the secular. Uh, it was in it was in uh, one of your earlier slides, and 
you know, just just to be clear, I think it's important to note that, <clears throat> you know, maybe it may, perhaps it's easier to understand what uh, Father Peter and what the uh, Franciscans, both Bonaventure and Scotus, are uh, implying, especially as used by Father Peter in this notion of secular, um, <clears throat> because uh, both Scotus and Bonaventure would not affirm that there was and this is clearer in SCOTUS, would not affirm that there ever was a time in which grace, some form of grace, some, some form or another of grace was uh, not operative or also the sin. So always creation, the created nature was disposed or ordered towards grace or ordered by grace or by sin. And so I think if we think about the uh, the words of Galatians uh, chapter four, uh, when when our Lord became incarnate in the fullness of time, there's a notion then of time being qualified. Um, and so in that sense, as time was qualified and in a sense filled up by being by having a qualitative preparation for the coming of our Lord, the coming of the Messiah, the 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 um, termination, so to speak, of one aspect of the mystery of uh, the children of Israel. So also uh, it, we can understand the notion of secular, uh, because I, I, I think we should avoid saying there is a, and I'm not saying Fra Charles was, was, was affirming this, but there is an ambiguity, because secular sounds a lot like, well, there's just this kind of neutral age of creation. And I don't think that I don't think that that's something that we want to, we want to argue for. Rather, uh, secular is saying something about aspects of creation as such that, and here's the key point, uh, types of acts and aspects of creation that are intrinsically by an analysis of their formal nature, like what they are, the kind of act they are, the kind of thing something is, that they're, they're neither sinful nor meritorious. I think that's the key point. So that's the secular moment that there are certain types of actions that are neither sinful nor meritorious in themselves. But all of these actions are caught up into an order that's either Adamic or uh, Christic and Marian. And so um, I, think, I think that's an important aspect. And so the secular is really um, a recognition and, and an admission that there is there is the possibility of the created, especially created person, for moving in a direction or in a disposition or being ordered towards grace and elevation or being ordered towards uh, sin and ultimately a kind of personal dissolution. And uh, it's, it's, it's the secular that helps us understand the, um, the, the, the pivotal moment of choice either for uh pride and self or for um humility and obedience to the will of of the father um so i thought i would i thought i'd raise that and just clarify that there i don't th i don't think there is a kind of pure secular um that is apart from a de facto and de jure involvement and disposition or disposing aspects in terms of either Adam or the new the, the first Adam or the second Adam. Thank you for uh, for that precision. I think uh, from my understanding with this point of the secular is it sort of saying that there <laughs> there are human values that are real um, in the sense that um, it's something that's really human and really good, even if it's not yet explicitly recapitulated, even if in the reality of how things go, something is either in Christ or against Christ. But also in this sense, too, that um, if it's not under Christ, even if not vicious, there's an instability there. And so the recapitulation yeah. gives stability, but um, that uh, I think it helps understand why sort of a uh, scorched earth spiritualism is not a, a Christian 
um, a Christian way of looking at the world. Yeah, I think that's I think that's exactly right, and I, I think the uh, I think the operative elements because what you said is there are truly created, truly human aspects of our experience that are are not simply bad um, without an explicit recapitulation, and that's what I what I said is there are certain acts or structures or actions that are neither that are neither meritorious in themselves nor sinful. And that's, that is the moment, in a sense, of understanding the secular. There are created goods, and they're good, but they're not, in a sense, very good, because they're not yet uh, recapitulated into the mode of grace. And I think uh, this distinction is very important because it immediately blocks. It, it, it recapitulates, it situates uh, Fra Joseph Pio, uh, F Father Joseph Pio's insight into the goodness of matter itself. It's a good, but it's not a very good until it's ordered and um, recapitulate it purposefully and intentionally and personally into the order of grace, because remember, grace and elevation, ultimately in the incarnation and the, through the incarnation, the, the perfection of the church is really why there's something rather than nothing other than God. That's the ultimate explanation for everything. It's not 42. Um, um, but uh, <laughs> sorry about the reference. Um, so there's there's an important thing. So there's a first act of creation that's good, but when 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 our Lord, when the Creator establishes it in um, with the gifts of preternatural charity or original justice, and then on top of that perfects original justice with sanctifying grace, well then it's very good, and that is actually what the secular is. The secular is not devoid of God right? Because the secular is always dependent upon God. That's just natural theology 101. And I think it's a mistake to see the secular as kind of neutral and then neutral as atheistic. I think that's a mistake that's seeding too much. What Father Peter and the Franciscans are, are saying is that, no, there, there is a good, but it's not, it's ordered for the very good, the ultimate good. And I think when, 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 and perhaps I'm stealing uh, people's thunder, but we've mentioned it uh, before, is <clears throat> this distinction in creation, say, between, uh, between first act creation and second act, the, the establishing of the man and the woman in the Garden of Eden. There's, there's, a, there's a goodness move to, to a greater goodness or a very goodness. Well, in a similar way, um, Father Peter's going to apply Scotus and uh, Saint, uh, Saint Maximilian to the life of the church. There's a good in being baptized because you're being recreated as a member of Christ. You're, there's a rebirth. And that, that in that action, in that event, you're infused with the um, theological virtues, especially charity. But they're, but they're habitual. This now, this now describes your state and your mode of living. But it doesn't yet in itself determine your mode of activity. And here's where they, so that's first act. You are a Christian, but nevertheless, Christians can live in a secular manner. And this is the point that um, Fra Charles was making, is if you are merely living in a secular manner, even as one of the baptized, it's inherently unstable because of all of the disorders, the, the, uh, the uh, effects of, <clears throat> and the still continuing effects of original sin through concupiscence, the disordering of the passions, uh, a tendency towards laxity, you will, you, you're in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a situation of inherent instability. <clears throat> and so you need what Father Peter is going to argue through the incorporation of the Immaculate Conception. You're not just living your life as a Christian in first act, as one of the baptized having the habit of grace and being basically secular, neither meritorious nor sinful in your particular acts because you're acting according to the mode of a secular person. No, you can, through a conscious activation, especially um, manifested or symbolized through uh, the sacrament of confirmation, but through a conscious decision, a choice, you can recapitulate and activate the habit through the actual graces of the Holy Spirit and the cooperation, the maternal mediation of Our Lady, you, you become actively engaged in the Christian life such that you're not just living habitually in an unstable way, 
which you can betray Christ at any moment. No, every moment you're, or at least as much as possible, it's like Paul says, you're praying without ceasing now. You're, con you're, you're constantly trying to be recollected and um, understanding all of your actions with an intention towards obeying the will of the Father through the Spirit. And so you're moving from the ontological state to the psychological and active state. And so now you become an active agent in this second act. First act, I'm a Christian. Second act, now I'm explicitly acting like a Christian. And therein, you move out of the realm of the secular into the realm of the sacred, precisely because you're now understanding each of your actions in relation to the birth, the new birth, but also the final consummation of why you are a Christian as such. And that renders a kind of full resolution or it provides the beginning of a full resolution in the intellectual sphere, but also, and more importantly, the affective sphere, because in a, you, you clarify your love. What we talked about last time, the, um, the single idea is now through this active conscious um, taking Jesus Christ in faith as your savior every day in your daily walk with God, I sound like an evangelical now, um, <clears throat> you are you are activating and really incorporating the mind of the Immaculate, because the Immaculate wasn't just filled with grace, right? She was always giving her fiat, her fiat in every moment, but her fiat dispositionally too. So it's like somebody who's married, um, you give a fiat at the ceremony, or somebody who's ordained, you give a fiat at the ceremony, and of course that, that will act is now something that characterizes every action within that. But even while being in a state of marriage or being ordained, you can forget about this. And actually you can just kind of go along and just take it for granted. And suddenly things can become unstable. So it wasn't that as though Mary was just conceived full of grace. No, every moment that she could consciously act, she was also saying, thy will be done. Just like our Lord, be it done unto me according to thy word. And I think that's the spirituality that Saint Maximin, Saint Maximilian is trying to bring forward and explain is it, 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 you can't take anything for granted in this sense, because we're always active agents, we're not just passive. Um, and when we merely live a passive life, we live in a kind of secular mode or with secular assumptions, we easily fall into a betrayal of Christ and a betrayal of our baptismal vows and uh, a kind of um, exchange of the gifts of of the sacraments for a mess of pottage, you know, we become like Esau. <clears throat> so anyway, I will, I will stop talking. Perhaps I guess to, before Father Joseph says something, I'll just really quick give two concrete examples, I think, I think of this sort of secular and recapitulation in Christ of good, very good, but again, neither of themselves. So when we talk about secular, as you were saying, it's not something that's standing by itself. Like, oh yeah, this is something secular here, but it's always within a trajectory. Yeah. Um, is, I remember reading something about some Catholic group <clears throat> hosting, I think it was like a bluegrass festival or something in, in the Appalachians or in, I think, like Western Te Virginia or something, probably sort of like the Christendom crowd. And the comment they made in this article was that they view these sorts of things as pre-evangelization in a way that you could say that part of the mission of the church now is you not only have to make the humans Christians, but now you have to make them humans again. <laughs> And a second example is in a podcast, the uh, Clerically Speaking podcast, one of the priests, Father Anthony, mentioned they had a youth retreat and two of the most impactful moments for the youth, the most impactful one was a time of adoration. The second most impactful was a time of recreation. And he said, because these teenagers don't know how to interact with other people in real life. And so it's like, okay, we need, they, they put all the cell phones in a box and took them away. And then everyone's like, well, what do we do now? He said, there's this very awkward, strange, like, how do you even break into this? 
And then he says, you know, thanks be to God, someone picked up a Frisbee and started throwing it. And then they had a great time just throwing the Frisbee around the room. But he said it was something like, like they don't, again, that you have to sort of make someone capable of that human interaction before you can start talking about like entering into um, uh, like ecclesial communion and ecclesial, you know, the unity of the Christian community. Or again, to make the analogy with marriage, again, that's another problem that you have to help people become like you have to help young men and women be able to relate to each other and make commitments before you can um, start talking about marriage. And if, you know, if they're like in some universities, they talk about if young men and women aren't able to actually interact unless they're both drunk, then you're not going to have any stable marriages coming out of that. But anyway, so then I'll, I'll pass it over to Father Joseph Pio, since it looked like he was getting ready to say something. I completely agree with that. And I'm working with the family now in the school, and we are starting with the, uh, the director of the school asked me for intervention in the, for the young couple of people, you know, with kids like 6 to 13 years old. And I'm starting with video games in family. I'm starting with the explanation of the impact of the video games in the society and on the kids and in the organization of the whole family. And you have to start dealing with this topic, which are a social topic, like bullying, like uh, video games, like um, imagination, I don't know, Harry Potter and that, that kind of stuff. Then you can go to explain feminism, gender, and you can get the uh, homosexuality, and then you can add the, at the last point will be, okay, what is the moral of the church, magistery? But you can't even start with something that, okay, let's start praying. They will not understand that. The people are just so far from the church. So they have to start with very, very um, common or very um, uh, daily life. And, and then you can try to do something for, for them after uh, the face. Um, the face uh, topic. So just for thing, uh, Brother Chai, you, you said about the, um, the two parts of the, the feminine part and the masculine part in the, in the mind kind. Um, I remember the book of uh, Father Fenner, it's uh, on the Holy Spirit. So um, I can't remember the, the titles, but he, he, he very, yeah, that's exactly very good. He ended in say talking about the feminism, if I remember well, and I can't. Uh, okay, I, I would have. I haven't read my notes, but uh, it was quite interesting. I would say something could be very. Um, I I don't know how to say it, but I would try. Because the immaculate conception is a mystery, so is something that we have to live uh, within a spirituality. And even in, in some ways, it's, it's something that has to be explained at, at the, um, for reason and for theology. But the point is, we have, uh, for now, uh, the destruction of the, um, the logical in the mind of the youth people, for example, if you take just, just the gender theology, the gen gender um, ideology, you have a destruction of, we could say, the, the foundation of um, masculinity and femininity. So my question is uh, how we could link that, uh, how the, the mystery of the Immaculate Conception will help or could help us. And uh, I can remember you, the, the way Father Checking was talking about Mary, taking his uh, human aspect is, um, is uh, the, the fact that she was from the tribe of Israel, that she was a young woman. So starting from the anthropology, going to, into the theology. But for, I would say, the person of Mary, by her acts, by her decisions, by her will, a free will, a conscience, then how we could, in some ways, with the dogma, helps the, helps the fact that we are men and women created by God as, as men or women. 
And now it has to deal with some, in some way, uh, the mystery of the immaculate will help us to enlighten the, our humanity. Or the way we are thinking about socially, we are thinking about the, uh, the conception of men and women and the family. And to, today we are, we are celebrating this uh, particular feast of the Madonna de Floreto. So it's the Holy Family, uh, Joseph, Mary, and uh, Jesus kid, Jesus, uh, child Jesus. So, okay, my, my question is very large. I, I understand that maybe you could help me in, in dealing with that. I guess a really quick comment on the, where I talked about sort of how the male and the female, Adam and Eve are present in all of our lives. I think Father Peter once commented when he was talking about sin and original sin about how the um, the and I think Benedict talks about this too on his in his catechesis on original sin is that um, that sort of process of temptation, just as later the process of recreation in Mary, but that process of temptation is relived out in our actual sins where there's an original temptation towards the concupiscible saying you know this is good this is something desirable and then as that is entertained you could say the um and this is i think in bonaventure talks about this in part which part is this part three chapter eight the the origin of actual sin um where you have suggestion and pleasure followed by consent and deed. And um, so you have sort of this preparation and then consummation, just like you had this process of the woman and the man. Anyway, so that's sort of more of what, what I meant, right? not you know leaving aside sort of depth psychology, but... Um, yeah, so that's what I meant by that, that, that those structures there are not just women or cause sin, but that that's something that is present within all of us, that they can also be sort of in a fractal symbolic pattern. Um, yeah, anyways, I'll leave that there. But you remember the father checking points is that uh, for us it's not only Mary, it's Mary and Jesus, and it's not it's not only Francis, it's Francis and Claire. So it's it was always about giving two example, two pattern of masculinity, femininity, and saying yeah, okay, we have complementation of the. Of I, the um, yeah, I think you I think you raise a good point, and you know, <clears throat> the topic is the topic is uh, so multifaceted and vast. And there really is so much to say that uh, it's difficult to even try to condense because you raise an excellent point. I would say uh, the first, the first and fundamental point is that when we say the 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 absolute primacy of Christ, we say that Christ was predestined for His own sake, right? What we're in, what we're, what we're also building into that definition is the mode, because this is what the church teaches, beginning with ineffabilis uh, Deus in uno eo demcre decreto in one and the same decree mary was predestined with christ but the interesting thing is here is that what that assertion um entails is a recapitulation and a re uh reconsideration dogmatically that that ramifies and refracts throughout all systematic theological but also philosophical anthropological reflection is the nature of creation and also the nature and order of human history for the sake of what? Well, the absolute primacy of Christ. But remember, what is the mission of Christ? Uh, John chapter, John chapters two and three and four speak about the, the coming of Christ who what? Gives the spirit without, um, without limitation. So in the sense, then, we see that... <clears throat> When we say that Mary is 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 predestined with Christ and one in the same decree, what we what we're actually seeing then is that that principle, in the first place, is the bringing forth, and insofar as Mary, now this this we could do a whole course on this because it's an excellent point. 
because we, we're going back to Genesis and creation, the typology, the relationship between uh, God and creation, right? There's this, there's this kind of active, passive, and mediatory component, right? God creates, the Holy Spirit hovers upon the face of the deep, and then brings order through that material um, aspect to creation. All of the, the, the different hierarchies of creation are brought forth through creation, through the power appropriated to the Spirit. So there's this, there's this active, passive principle, but also there's this active, then mediatory and terminating principle. So you have this in creation at the beginning, and creation is then modeled as a place for God's presence to dwell. And again, it's it's God being with man. There's a there's a there's a, there's a God component and there's a companion component component. And so there's always this complementary. When God acts in creation, it's always to enter into presence with um, humankind. And so there's this kind of bridal, this groom and bridal component. The, 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 there's these always these two aspects, and you see this recapitulated through the. Um, the language of Genesis, where the creation itself is described in similar terms as the construction of the tabernacle, and then in, 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 in Exodus, so there's a place that's built for God to dwell in after the fall, after the flood, after the Tower of Babel, after the calling of Abraham uh, and Israel, after the... Um, <clears throat> the uh, sojourn in Egypt and through the desert, you have a tabernacle, but the tabernacle mirrors in the language, the, the language of creation. So then you're seeing, well, oh, there's this, this, is, there's this kind of uh, relationship between God and creation as a place to make present or be present to uh, creation. And then you see uh, as, the, as history moves forward, the children of Israel take on a special mission. And the special mission ultimately is to what? Be the bride of God, but be the bride of God insofar as the Messiah is brought forth and in fact is the divine son who then recapitulates Israel and takes Israel, the new Israel, as a bride. And so um, <clears throat> when, we, when we see then that Mary is predestined with Christ and Christ is the purpose, he's the reason why there's something rather than nothing, we're seeing that at the front end, and this is typified as Mary as the virgin earth. At the front end, Mary is the virgin earth from which Adam is taken forth. And so this is the efficient, the order of efficient causality. This is the immaculate conception. She's the unfallen earth. Uh, that brings forth the second Adam in the order of efficient causality. But in the order of final causality, she's not only to be the mother, but she's also to be the spiritual bride. Because as we've always seen, the creation exists for God to be in union with creatures. So in a sense, he's extending that Trinitarian union through the Holy Spirit to all of creation and especially through rational creatures recapitulating and ordering all of creation into this relationship of, of union. And so we see that there's one purpose of that predestination, but ultimately the, um, the, the final cause or the purpose of creation is for Christ not only to uh, assume a human nature, created nature, and that's the, that's the primary term of the mission of the Son is to take on humanity, but taking on humanity precisely so that he can, through his ministry, give the Spirit. And what's the term of the mission of the Spirit? Primarily, and we find this both at, um, at uh, the cross, where he gave up his Spirit, he said it is finished, and then through the action of the, the lance, he pours forth water and blood, typifying the sacraments of baptism in the Eucharist. So in a sense, you have the... Um, the conception of the church sacramentally through baptism in the Eucharist typified in the giving up, uh, giving forth his spirit, <clears throat> and then the, uh, the, the blood and water flowing forth, but 50 days later, right, and 40 days later, he ascends to the Father, and he says, I must go, otherwise I can't send the other comforter, but then 10 days after his ascension, 50 days after um, uh, Passover, he descends, he sends his spirit. And in a sense, then you have the birth of the church, but the church is actually the true perfect bride of our Lord Jesus. So in a sense, then you always see this, this language of one flesh union 
because you have the masculine and the feminine component. You have the groom and the bridegroom. And we find then in the absolute predestination of Christ, it's not just that he assumed humanity, but he assumed humanity and builds up a bride, creates a bride as a living temple. And you see the imagery going back in prophecy to Ezekiel, but then coming to fruition at the end of the book of the Apocalypse, is you have the heavenly Jerusalem descending, and that is a bride. Paul speaks, St. Paul speaks in Ephesians as being adorned as a bride, the church being adorned as a bride. And <clears throat> so this is, this is, this is the complementary uh, the, the complementarity of the two principles, masculine and feminine, seen in um, ecclesiology is that the groom, the incarnation was always for the sake of not just the assumption of the human nature and the hypostatic union, but through that nature, the giving of the spirit and building up a spiritual bride, which again, going back, is typified uh, in a privileged way through the sacrament of marriage. Uh, there was another point I was going to make, but I, I think... Um, in that sense, the, the Immaculate Conception reveals one aspect of the mystery in the order of the perfection of creation and the Old Covenant that looks forward to the ultimate perfection in um, becoming the perfect spiritual bride, the Queen Mother of the Groom in the, um, the conception and birth of the Church. And the church moving forward. So in that sense, the mission of Christ through his spirit is continuing in the church and will only be uh, consummated in, in its fullness at the end of time. And of course, there's much there's much greater uh, and more detailed case to be made, especially uh, in, in biblical theology. Um, temple theology is very important, as well as covenant theology in, in um, explaining these things and further elaborating these these questions but excellent question and you I you, mean, was, I, Father, yeah. you, you were saying one pur purpose of predestination is union and as well something else uh, i can't uh, i haven't remember. well the, okay yes the well when we say the christ was predestined mm -hmm. for his own sake when we look at the when we look at the order of salvation history christ came to to be fully present as god to creation and in that fully full presence, he, he serves as a mediator because he is the mediator and he's also the second person of the Trinity. So that means he comes not only to be present in creation, to tabernacle in creation, as John chapter one says, but also then to, in that tabernacling, make himself approachable and united with creation. And that is his mission of sending the spirit. But what's the term of the spirit? The spirit is to create that bond of charity that is the bride. That's the bride-groom uh, relationship. So Christ was always predestined not only to take on flesh, but to give his spirit such that he's married spiritually to his church. And so the term of the absolute predestination is not Christ in his humanity as abstracted, but Christ in his humanity with his bride. That is the term. It's the Adam and Eve. It's the one flesh. It's the full humanity united back to God. And so you have a relation then between father sending, son assuming, but then the son in the economy, as in the uh, eternal trinity, also sending that spirit. And what is the spirit? Well, the spirit is um, the spirit is the gift or the bond or the nexus. And so when that spirit is sent and it terminates, it creates a bond. <clears throat> One thing I think is, is interesting to note, if you go back into uh, the passage of uh, Genesis, what is it? Is it chapter, chapter two? Uh, it might be the second narrative of, of the creation of the woman. Remember, she's taken from the side of Adam. But that, the, the, the term for being taken from the side is the same term. It's an architectural term. And it's an architectural term that in context typically refers to the building of the temple. There's a building, it's, it's a, it, the, the woman was built up as a temple structure from the man. And in a sense then, the, the, there, there's a kind of mutual indwelling. And you find this recapitulated because you have, uh, after the Exodus, you have the building of the tabernacle according to the heavenly model, right? So there's a place that's built up and then what's, what's then um, instructed? Well, you have the establishment 
of the priesthood. Then you have the, the explanation of the rites. And then you have the carrying out of the sacraments in, in Leviticus. But, but all three of the main sacraments, you have the tribute, the, the ascension, and the peace offerings. Right? But what's the purpose? It's to expiate. And it's to, it's to cleanse, but ultimately for the sake of establishing peace. There's always peace. And peace is the watchword of St. Francis, because peace is the mode of living in the spirit. So it's to establish peace and union. And it was the peace offering that was the, um, it was the only offering that the whole family would eat together. So it was a, it was a communal offering. And I think this is, again, looking forward to the New Covenant and the Eucharist. Yes, it is an expiatory sacrifice represented because it's a representation of the cross. But in and through that, it's the same giving of the Holy Spirit in order to increase the bonds of charity. So it's, it's both the sacrifice, but it's also the intensification of unity. So you have that bride, or uh, that groom, that husband-wife relationship that's uh, instantiated. And so the Immaculate Conception opens up upon reflection of what the purpose of the Incarnation is, because it specifies the purpose of creation and the history of the Old Covenant, but moving into, more importantly, the perfection and elevation of the cosmos, as well as the people of Israel, into a life of the Church that becomes truly universal, both in its cosmic but also historical scopes. And so I think that's I think that's helpful. And it's always important to remember that Christ is always predestined with his bride and his bride for the sake of Christ. Because remember, Paul says, you are Christ's and Christ is God's. Remember? Talking to the church. <clears throat> it, it makes sense for me because you say that. So the, the Holy Spirit is a bond of charity. So if, if we have the Immaculate Conception full of the Holy Spirit, so she have also this mission of being in some way as being a bond for, of charity for uh, his child, her child, her children. So this this is maybe the point for saying okay she she has the the, the, divine, the divine maternity but she has a spiritual maternity on us and for for doing that she needs uh, powers in the sense of the dogma it could be saying that she is the mediatrix of four graces because she needs this this um, particular graces from the holy spirit to for being the mother of all the all the children of the church in that sense yeah, and I think I think um, I think what's important with respect to the Immaculate Conception is that uh, the the fiat of Mary is truly free, and so the Immaculate Conception is a way of explaining her disposition that was perfectly free and open to say yes from the side of creation without any disposition or towards Satan or the order of sin. She's 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 not. She's perfectly free as a creature through the power of the spirit to say yes to this incarnation and then uh, continue to cooperate in a maternal mode um, modeled on the analogy of and types of the Old Testament um, throughout the rest of the, uh, the, the life of Christ, but also then from her assumed position assumed in heaven uh, in the church still. I think, I think one thing I would say uh, just remember that there, there are two main typological foci of Mary. One is Mary as virgin earth, and the other is Mary as new Eve. And, I, and, and if you look at them in terms of the order of efficient and final causality, or the order of uh, historical execution, you will see that virgin earth, in a sense, is prior to new Eve, right? Because she's first the mother from which Adam is taken. She's that, she's, that, she's that unfallen earth from which the new Adam is taken, but she also then takes on, in a primary way, as his disciple, the, the role of new Eve. And it's not new Eve as spouse, it's new Eve as queen mother. So we move from the analogy or the typology of Adam and Eve 
to Solomon and Bathsheba in that sense. King Solomon and Bathsheba, where he's the, he's the prince of peace. His name means peace. And she's the queen mother. Mary is the queen mother. So you see a, you see a, re, a, a recapitulation and development of types that move towards ever greater manifestation and perfection. So the church can both be a mother and a bride because Mary, and Mary fulfills these two types beautifully because remember, Paul speaks of that mother from above, that heavenly Jerusalem. So he speaks of the church as mother. Well, if the church is mother and it's our mother, well, how can we be bride? Well, Mary has both of those types. She's both mother of the church, but she's also bride of the, of the groom, the husband. And so we can understand how we then um, are mothers, but also brides in the church. You, you just can't be too... You can't be too strict. You have to be able to use these different types in different ways. I think that's the big thing. Yeah. No, it, it has been proved by Ugo Vanni in his book on uh, Apocalypse, the, the Cardinal. And it has been proved that uh, you have to keep the boss side of, of uh, the, the woman in uh, Apocalypse 12. So she has to be the church and Mary as well. Otherwise, you are reducing the mystery that is uh, giving there. Yeah. Thank you. Andrew, do you have any observations? Yeah, just uh, thinking through something in my head. The, uh, it's interesting how like, because I, I remember reading that section um, in Father Peter's book on St. Maximin and Colby, where he's talking about uh, the difference between masculine and feminine and how we have to distinguish it metaphysically prior to distinguishing it like biologically and it's really interesting if you if you think about it where where father peter talks about masculine as being active and independent whereas feminine being passive and dependent and that in the the very first distinction is actually like what it means to be woman or really to be feminine is precisely to be like you might be you might say it's almost defined as the virgin earth you know is like because the virgin earth is god creates it and that if we understand that typologically in reference to our lady then she's the personalization of what it means to be woman not the fact that she's biologically a woman but just because if we equate virgin earth and the immaculate conception, you think about the immaculate conception, she's utterly dependent in receiving that. Like she doesn't merit it. She doesn't say, yes, I want to be the immaculate conception, utterly passive and dependent. And just like the virgin earth, the virgin earth cannot bring forth anything unless the spirit ho hovers over it, unless the spirit draws um, different forms, the, 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 I guess the seminal reasons being contained in the virgin earth and bringing out those forms. So like, cause I'm trying to, you know, with uh, what father uh, Joseph is saying, or father Joseph saying is, um, you know, what does it really mean to put the immaculate conception kind of at the center and to incorporate the immaculate conception into the life of the church? I think, Biblically speaking, if we, or if we if we're to find that answer biblically, um, that that relationship between the Virgin Earth and that being personified in Our Lady, I think that understanding of the Immaculate Conception is going to be really important because just like from the Virgin Earth in the original creation, everything comes forth. Every single species comes forth. Plant animal person well so too with and then obviously adam and then eventually eve coming forth but so too in the new economy or the new covenant you have our lady as the virgin earth bringing forth the entire new creation so you might say the new form that we receive through being elevated to the supernatural order and being um you know and every form of you might say growth or development you know, stems from that. So really the Immaculate Conception, if it's related typologically to the Virgin Earth, 
it's really at the, the very center of the new creation. I mean, everything comes forth from that in the new creation. You have the new Adam, you have the church coming forth from the side of Christ. So really it is, that mystery is absolutely foundational. I mean, it's the basic, it's, it's the very beginning, just like without the virgin earth, there is nothing. Like the Holy Spirit brings out nothing. Like that's the very condition. And it defines what it means to be creation as such, or to be a creature as such is really this, the mystery of the immaculate conception, passive and, and dependent. And then um, with respect to the actual virginal conception and birth of Christ, that's where obviously an active part comes through on the side of Our Lady where the spirits, you know, he's not just coming down upon her and drawing out everything without her cooperation, that the mystery is that creation is cooperative by its very nature. You can't, you may, you may say it's harder to see in the virgin earth itself because it almost seems like it's doing nothing, but you might almost say it has the disposition to have these forms drawn from, from it, you know, in a certain sense. So Our Lady is almost like, uh, what do you call it? The, the seminal reason itself, <laughs> that from which everything in the new economy comes forth in a certain sense. Um, and, uh, so, yeah, I mean, I just think it's really interesting that like first this idea of woman, it's not even related to uh, Eve yet. Like Eve is only a derivative form of woman or feminine in the real sense. And um, because when Adam is created, he's not even distinguished into male and female until later like you can you can only talk about male in terms of masculine when eve is actually there otherwise there's no basis for the distinction between male and female it's almost like a relative term that you only have masculinity biologically if you have femininity but prior to that it's just adam as typifying the new adam or really typifying the divine you know that which is independent and active and then the virgin earth relative to Our Lady as typifying um, the woman or feminine in its essence. And then, you know, Eve coming forth from Adam, the church coming forth from the side of Christ, where the church can be identified, obviously, as Our Lady first. Um, and then, you know, the, the church, the rest of the church, the members of the body of Christ, um, yeah, I know I'm just kind of spitting a lot out, but it's just, I don't know, it's interesting to me when, when trying to like really pinpoint like what, why is the Immaculate Conception like so important? And I think, and, and you know, because I've thought about it a lot when Colby talks about incorporating the mystery of the Immaculate Conception, like into the life of the church, like what does that mean? You know, like really sitting down and and thinking about it, how, what does that even look like? How does that happen? What, I, I can't, I can't figure out the intelligibility of it to some. Or when well, I, was I mean, maybe if we could relate it to something that you said earlier and somebody else said earlier, that is the comment you made about how Our Lady, in um, sort of the Ur example, or, or no, it was. Um, no, this was, I spoke earlier today with Father Jose Maria, and he he commented, he watched the video from last time, and he commented about how we were talking about history and metaphysics and all this, and how there, there's this sort of third category that rises up that ex, sort of, you know, you've got maybe history like this, and then you can move and see the metaphysical plan working out through history and but he commented that um, with uh, that that's sort of what Our Lady is doing as she's meditating on things in our heart, and she's putting together both the the will of God as it's working out <clears throat> in the history of the people of Israel and in her own personal history, and. Um, so he said that's the immaculate 
in the immaculate heart. And so basically what we're trying to do is we're just imitating Mary in that meditating and putting things together um, in that. But anyway, so speaking with the point of soil of the virgin earth, so that was the one point there that Our Lady is doing that in her in her heart. Um, there's also the parable of the soils, and there you have the good soil, you have the the bad soils, the one that doesn't receive anything, the one that receives with with joy. Maybe you could say with a uh, a burst of edenic fever, 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 fever. Um, in a way, like it's almost like I'm in the garden again, everything's wonderful. <clears throat> and then difficulties come and it shrivels up. Then you have those who don't keep the word, who don't guard the word, and they end up fruitless, but then the good soil bears fruit. <clears throat> and a, a point with this parable is the paradox is the soil is as the seed finds it. The soil can't see like, oh, there's a seed I need to prepare better to receive the seed that I have now. But that um, the paradox in that is it's like the soil is, the seed in the story, the seed is the protagonist, even if it's not mentioned much and the soil is just sort of there, but that's the center of the telling. And um, so likewise, here with Our Lady being the virgin earth, the one who can receive the, the seed of the word and then bear fruit, who keeps it as well. Um, I think, but that you would want to say that a part of, like we were saying, that part of Scotus's analysis of pure prime matter is that its act is to be open to higher forms. So likewise, that feminine, you could say passivity or receptivity is in view of maternity. And so the, you could say there's an image that um, of the woman as receptacle or of container. And I think this comes from Carrie Gress um, that, there's an, you could say an emptiness, a sterility that is orientated towards fertility. And so I just, I don't want to say like passive femininity, passive punctum, um, but that in that passiveness, in the immaculate conception, that there is a active openness to receiving the seed and then putting the immaculate conception at the center is basically making the good soil the the point of reference in our lives and um, um so i think that's 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 part of it um where you have both the receptivity but also the the guarding, and this is talking again about the fall, moving a chapter forward in Genesis. One of the points that some people, I, I haven't found where this is commented on by any biblicist at length, but an interesting point that you hear from different speakers is that sort of the first fault is not so much the entering of Eve into dialogue with the serpent, but one of the questions is, is well, why is there a serpent in the garden? And the, the answer is, is because Adam wasn't doing his job of keeping the garden. And I bring this up sometimes, and I think some of the professors are worried that I'm, I'm thinking that the, the account is like a literal, you know, videographic description of the fall of humanity. Um, but no, it's, it's pointing out that that sort of the first fall is the lack of vigilance. And that's something you see, I think, is it in the triple way where Bonaventure, it's interesting because he starts with negligence in his sort of description of, you know, sin, of the various ways in which we are 
um, in the various ways, yeah, that we send a, a vice. The first thing he starts with is negligence of attention. <clears throat> but then that goes first full circle to return to the malice of acedia. And so it's interesting since you start with sort of negligence and most of us would sort of just immediately associate negligence and malice or negligence and acedia. But no, he says that there's, you go from negligence and then you go all the way. I mean, it's sort of like a full circle to where you're going from the, the very opening of it all the way to, um, and I, I don't, do I have it within reach? It's almost within reach. Um, so yes, the I think it's in this one, yeah. Okay. Okay, so the very basically the full human evil at full term is malice. So you basically go from negligence to concupiscence to malice. And then it um in three forms you have anger, envy, and sloth, which is I think would be translated from acedia. Um, yeah, acedia. But anyway, so then what that acedia is, is he describes it as from it comes suspicions of evil, blasphemous thoughts and malicious detractions. That um, Father Peter's Note is that what happens is the lukewarm soul, that is the akedos, the not caring soul, um, judges his neighbor piteously, so that's suspicions of evil, and unjustly accuses him before God of being responsible for his own negligences, again, going back to the first point, the beginning of the section, and their consequences within the whole life of sin. And that's the blasphemous thoughts, which is in another way, why did you eat the apple? Because she said so. Um, and then, or the woman you gave me, gave it to me. Um, and then, so then he, where this thing goes into malicious detractions, he judges God by his own malice. So my evil becomes what I impute on God. So you have like the... Um, the pusillanimous, the small-souled servant who's given one talent and he just buries it. And then when the master says, why did you do that? He says, because I know you're a hard master. And so it's sort of like the small-souled, or it's like God says, I'm, oh, how does it go in the Psalms? It says that God is, you know, like merciful with the merciful, but uh, with the cunning, he is cunning. That is like basically the way you the way you comport yourself towards God. If you're merciful, you receive mercy. If you're merciless, if you're manipulative, then it's going to seem like God is that way too, because you're judging God by your own malice and entertaining blasphemous thoughts of Him, accusing Him of severity, of exactingness, and of hard heartedness. Oh, and then look, Father Peter compares it to that servant with one gold piece. Um, but anyway, so that was just, again, remarking on the fall and how that Mary keeps the word. So part of what the good soil does is it keeps, it keeps the word away from the birds. It allows the roots to go deep because it meditates on it. And then because it I don't know. We'll have to find a connection of how it, uh, it it avoids the anxiety of 
and cares for riches the world because it seeks the one thing necessary, like the other Mary at the other um, Mary and Martha, that Mary seeks the one thing necessary. Um, anyways, so those are some disjointed. No, can I add something? It, it's please, please do. Yeah, because uh, uh, to reach the point of Andrew, uh, which was very, um, very good for uh, according to me. So you were you were you were talking about the, the disposition, no? How, what is why why is the immaculate conception is so important for us uh, or in the church? And I would talk uh, something about the. Um, you know, for the last dogma, we could say, okay, Mary, maybe, or we don't know exactly, but co-redemptrix and mediatrix, and then she's the advocate. So um, meditating on the, the term advocate uh, is quite close to the mystery of this uh, virgin earth. Because if we understand that the way Maximin Kolb was saying that the devil has refused the mystery of the incarnation, and then refusing that, he refused that the mother could be the mother of God. So he refused the immaculate conception. So at the very beginning, uh, God show him the immaculate conception, and he becomes very angry about that. So he, he refused the maternity, and even the maternity of Mary on him, so he refused everything and even the maternity of Mary. So the mystery of the Immaculate Conception. But why it was so um, stressed, I mean, uh, something very crucial is that because God, according to me, I don't know if it's something theological that I, I will say, but God has to preserve his eternal um, felicity or eternal, um, so the Trinity wanted one creature that would be never um, under the power of the sin, so that all the creation, all the creature could have left God, even the angel, even the mankind, but unless almost one creature should have uh, been um, immaculate and then remain with God. So in that sense, we can talk about Mary as bail of the creation. So the mystery as Mary as a condition of possibility, because God would have not created everything if almost one would remain, one creator remain faithful to him. So the mystery of the Immaculate Conception in that sense is a um, condition of possibility of creation. And in that sense, it's something that is previous and that it's linked with even our in the mind of God, there is no creator, there is no for Charles, Andrew, um, there is nobody else without this bail of the creation so that even if we fail, even if we um, go far from God, then his consolation will be his bride, his um, Mary. And I don't know if it's theologically possible, but um, I would... Maybe Maximin Kolb talk about that. Uh, um, the first part, of what I said on the on the devil that refused the mystery of the immaculate conception. Well, yeah, you. I think you've touched upon that. Um, with uh, Saint Maximilian follows people like uh, uh, Saint Bernardine of Siena. Um, many of the many of the uh, Franciscans uh, look at the original fall as occasioned by a kind of telescoped uh, vision of, say, Apocalypse 12 and Genesis 3 together. And so, in a sense, the, the reason why Satan chose to, to rebel uh, was because of the vision of the woman bringing forth the man-child who will rule the nations uh, with a rod of iron. And remember uh, that, especially after the fall and um, looking at uh, like Deuteronomy 32, verse 8, you have the the uh, allotment or allocation of the nations according to the sons of God, but Israel was kept for God Himself uniquely. Um, and then you have instances of, uh, like in the Book of Daniel, where Michael um, struggled with the Prince of Persia. These these were taken as uh, indicators of a certain kind of. Um, 
interaction between uh, spiritual forces. Paul speaks of principalities and powers. Um, and I think uh, what you mention is the refusal to accept the Immaculate Conception be, and the Immaculate Conception for the sake of the Incarnation is uh, exactly how St. Maximilian, following St. Bernardine, uh, and also, I believe, uh, St. Lawrence of Brindisi, uh, how he understood the, the motivation or the cause or occasion of the fall is this non servium, not merely to the will of, of, of God as, as revealed, but the will of God as manifested and foreshadowed or prophesied through the mystery of the, uh, of the, of the woman who would bring forth the uh, man child. One thing also I wanted to comment on your very, very excellent um, comments is, you know, you have, you have the three main um, offices of Mary that participate in a unique um, <clears throat> but maternal mode in the three main offices of Christ. You know, as Christ recapitulates and um, perfects in himself the offices of, of prophet, priest, and uh, king, the royal prerogatives. Well, if you, if you look carefully at the way in which Mary's roles relate participatorially is that, well, Mary is called teacher, which corresponds to prophetic office, right? And she's also called co-redemptrix, which corresponds to the priestly office. And she's also called mediatrix, which corresponds to the royal office. But I think what you, what you, you can, you can subsume all of these under a common title of advocate because advocate is precisely the maternal role in which Mary participates and which we then participate with respect to one another and with respect to the, the world is where we are advocates because we bear the spirit, the, the, the uncreated gift of the spirit, but also the created graces and habits of the theological virtues precisely in order to a, bring forth Christ in ourselves, but also to bring Christ and make Christ present to others in various ways. And so, absolutely, I think in one sense, it would be helpful if we just simply called Mary Advocate, because what that does is it actually gets very, very close, strangely, etymologically, to what St. Maximilian was, was, was talking about, about created and uncreated immaculate conception, because what is advocate in Greek? Or... Another word is comforter, paraclete. And that's a name appropriated uh, to the Holy Spirit. So when you say Mary is advocate, well, our Lord is advocate, yes, but he sends another advocate, the Holy Spirit. And in that sense, she becomes the feminine um, reaction to the priestly masculine principle of our Lord, precisely in becoming advocate for us because she uh, models or images the mission of the spirit that comes through Christ in the church. Uh, and so I think, I think those were, that was a very, uh, very important uh, and interesting comment you made about advocate because advocate etymologically and theologically closely relates to a primary uh, functional designator of, and personal designator of the Holy Spirit in the economy of salvation. And so advocate can, can be an umbrella term to summarize the, the three main offices that we that theologians have attributed to Mary based upon her analogy to the three offices of Christ. I mean, in one sense, we, we are all media, mediators, we are all um, priests, and we are all teachers by dint of being Christian. And so then we're just noting uh, the different roles and unique ways in which uh, persons and uh, offices or orders within the church, sacraments within the church, uh, carry out these roles and manifest these different offices. Can I really, I'll really quick make a few points I saw, and then maybe Dr. Goff, if you have any concluding remarks that you think might be helpful, then we'll uh, say a prayer and call it a day or evening or whatever. One would be, we talked a little bit about Father Peter's observations about feminism and Mary and the Holy Spirit and all that in response to some of the criticisms of St. Maximilian as being a proto-feminist theologian. 
And where Father Peter, I think he interestingly say, he says, why is God he? Because Mary is she. And so it's sort of like a, the mirror, um, Mary mirrors God in that way that we call him he because reflecting off of her is she. And it's not a direct like attempt to, of the patriarchy to divinize males. Then also with the point of Adam before the creation as being neither male or female, I think that has to be understood as not trying to say like he was biologically androgynous, but that rather it's saying, it's pointing out like what St. John Paul II says is that the masculine body doesn't make sense without the female and the female doesn't make sense without the male, that there's a core, they're correlated to each other, they're ordered to each other to enter in and the very language of the body themselves enter into a relationship, a, a giving of one to the other. And so in that sense too, and then I think when we're talking about masculine, feminine, male, female, and recognizing that you can describe a part of any person as the masculine and part of any person as the feminine, how these sort of symbolo symbological or symbolic tropes are realized are in a way sort of focalized more in women than men, but at the same time are present in everyone's life. I remember one example given of, you know, the idea of the man is the, the one who conquers the dragon to win the, the woman. And there was a woman who, you know, in this discussion who said that on the one hand, the idea of someone fighting the dragon to win her heart was something that was very moving. But at the same time, she said she also wanted to have sort of a heroic journey of her own and not just wait around, you know, just not be this sort of passive uh, damsel in distress. And so that both, are, when we're talking about these symbologically, it's not saying that men only have this and women only have that. Um, so to sum that back up, talking about Adam before Eve as being neither masculine or feminine, is not saying that he's biologically androgynous, but saying that the two are made relating, are made for each other. And if you just take a masculine body by itself, like there's not something that makes sense about that but yeah um it's not coming out well but uh anyways so that was one point i wanted to clarify um then when it comes to co-redemptrix mediatrix i noticed that both of those so we've talked a little bit about we talked a bit about mediation in the trinity and how there is a mediating action of the holy spirit but there's only one mediator and so there's a mediating action of the Holy Spirit. I think I've heard it one person quoted as saying that the, there's one mediator, but then the Holy Spirit is mediation. Um, and I think maybe part of especially co-redemptrix, and I don't know, this might be something to, to reflect on, but also maybe mediatrix is that maybe part of the resistance to those terms is that in a way in its sort of function as a substantive, as a noun, it's like, okay, you have the mediator and then you have the mediator, mediatrix, you have the re redeemer and you have the redemptrix. And by seeing this as Mary sort of <clears throat> being the created principal term of the action of the Holy Spirit in the economy, that by referring to this as in the Trinity itself, there's one mediator, there's one middle person, but there's also the a mediating action of the Holy Spirit in the sense of that he's gift and link, or um, that he's both the, the, the gift of love and it's uh, the communion of love. And that it can't, you can't say that that's he's another mediator just simply. And so I think in that sense, if we see these Marian titles relating to that action of the Holy Spirit within the Trinity and then within the economy as well, then maybe that helps put in focus the unis or the uniqueness of Christ's role as mediator between God and man 
redeemer of the human race that anyway so yeah the, those are um i'll hand it over to dr goff if he has any concluding comments and then uh I am maria oh and then for reference so uh, I, I want to say you no know, uh pope benedict is 16 he wrote uh, two little books no uh, maria chiesa nascente and uh La Fia di Sion, and he explained no, that uh, Mary is a concrete uh, representation of a church. It is a, a personal, Mary is a personalization of a church. So uh, he said, no, Mary is the church. If you want to know uh, what is uh, God want from a church, what a church has to be, that is Mary. And then he has, he has explained you know, a, a famous side of the church. And he said the uh, church is famous because of Mary. Thank you. That's all. Yes, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> well, uh, yes, thank you for all your comments and your uh, observations. Um, I, I don't really have much to add uh, to this, this to this helpful uh, conversation. One thing uh, I suppose I, I would um, emphasize is that I think the, I think a key distinction um, when talking about the person of our Lord, and then the role that he takes primarily and the person of Our Lady and the role that she takes primarily uh, is, is very helpful in looking at the, um, the order of communication and termination in the Trinity itself. Um, and this is one in which obviously the Son proceeds via the natural act of intellection and the Spirit proceeds via the voluntary act of, of, of charity. And I think um, what is being specified very clearly and what is uniquely mediatorial about our Lord is that his person by definition, by ontological constitution is mediatory, right? Whereas the spirit has a mediating function, ultimately the spirit's ontological constitution is what to be complement as as uh, as Saint Bonaventure says, complement or perfection or even glory of the Trinity, love of the Trinity, and in this sense, you see the the complementarity in in creation, insofar as the Spirit is, the Spirit does have a mediating function, but the Spirit isn't mediator in the primary ontological sense. The Spirit is rather complement in the primary ontological sense in the Trinity. Um, even though the spirit can be a true mediator, but the spirit is uh, ultimately bond through the mediator um, in the in the order in the Trinity, and this is manifested in the order of creation. So Our Lady can be mediatrix because already she has been had mediated to her the spirit by the operation of the Son, and um, she can she can ultimately be advocate because all be, because mediation in the first sense is, is speaking of creating unities uh, between um, usually uh, items at a distance. There's a distance separating them and mediation brings those two together as though they're already distinct or as they're, all, as they're, as they're separate. Um, and in that sense, the mediatory function of the sun is not, <clears throat> um, is not one of bringing together those things separate. So, so, so it's not bringing, to, it's not bringing to, it's not, it's not closing a distance. It's actually created, creating an order of unity in the perfection of love that is the spirit. And in a similar way, um, the, the typology of the, 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 the pre-differentiated Adam, I think is is what's it what is what is being hinted at because Adam never existed as androgynous, right? In 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 this sense of but there is an aspect of <clears throat> Adam contains human nature uniquely from which 
all of human nature can be derived. And in that sense, when he was created and he, and he wasn't, he, he, he didn't find any, any animal like to himself. And God said, it's not good for him to be alone. Then of course, the differentiation occurred from the side of Adam in, in a, in a kind of quasi uh, creative way. It was a, it was a unique act of creation. And in that sense, I think the typology of Adam being alone is, is important because what that is indicating is that Adam is always intended to have a bride. And in the order of the narrative of creation, it was Adam was only complimented. Uh, Adam only achieved glory, both in his person, but also in the nature, in the bringing forth of the woman. So in some sense, on that uh, sixth day where Adam was evaluating and judging the animals and naming them he was he was creation wasn't fully complete until that unique act of drawing the woman from the side of adam and then complementing and perfecting adam in this uh dual principle and i think in that sense then adam functions as a, a mediator bringing forth something that was already in already intrinsic to him that's what i'm trying to say He's not bringing together something that was distant. Actually, it's the creating of distinction that gives the impression of distance. But in the operation of the Holy Spirit, what's already united is through the Spirit, fully um, distinguished and then related in a kind of, in an absence of distance. And I think the, uh, the, the, the solitude of Adam, yet the bringing forth as the crown and complement of creation of the woman from the side of Adam is a, is a very helpful indication that when we think of the absolute primacy of Christ, we're always at the same time thinking of the absolute primacy of Christ with the bride already presupposed that he creates through the power of the Holy Spirit. And of course, it's typified in the flowing of the blood and the water, and then the birth of the church, the distinguishing of the church, but yet that relationship of charity in the spirit, because the primary type is the sending of the spirit at, at Pentecost. And so it's always important to see both of these aspects in common, because I think it's actually written into the very story of Genesis that's being recapitulated and, and developed. Um, so uh, I think I think that that about does it. It looks like Fra Charles is about ready to hit the sack. Um, I I remember the the point that I wanted to make again about male and female and about how when we talk about these, we're both talking about sim. It's an interesting thing that we can bring in many things. We can talk about sort of symbolic. Um, archetypes or in, in general symbols, but at the same time, we can talk about sort of the phenomenological experience of men and women and the interactions and emotional um, dynamic between the two. We can also talk about today, we have a lot more with biology than the medievals had, which lead to other interesting things about, and again, it, where it's not just this, it, like before we, you know, Aristotelians thought that the man, woman did nothing. And now we know that she's doing the same thing as the man but i think there's still even in the biology of, of procreation there's still things that you can sort of the same symbolic patterns are being replicated so it's an interesting thing that we can have all these different points when we're talking about masculine and feminine phenomenological biological existential anyways I just wanted to. I think. I think. Uh, just a quick point is that uh, Scotus, unlike uh, Saint Thomas, understood that th both the men and the women are active principles, coessential principles, yet ordered, producing a common effect. And so he he followed, as as you all know, he followed Galen, and his speculation about human procreation over and against uh, Aristotle, which I think is quite interesting because it has implications, at least as you noted, symbolically for how his entire theological project worked out and um, his, his dispositions, if not um, philosophical and theological assumptions or presuppositions. It shows a certain disposition. Um, 
in approaching these questions of ordered um, co-causal unity rather than um, instrumental cause and um, independent causality. So you have primary and secondary instrumental. Well, SCOTUS oftentimes would say, well, there's a primary and secondary causal relation, but it's not the best way to understand it in terms of just pure instrumentality because the secondary cause has a true um, spontaneous uh, agency, uh, an agency arising from within according to its own powers. So it's, it's different. I mean, Bonaventure and Scotus's theory of sacramental causality is very much like um, his other theories or application of essentially ordered co-causes, not merely physical instrumental causality. Um, but anyway, I don't, it's, it, that's another topic. <clears throat> So yeah, and the topic of like biology, just like an interesting thing about how woman being taken from man, just, you know, women have two X chromosomes, man has an X and a Y. So hypothetically, you could clone, clone a woman from a man, but you can't go the other direction. And so then the creation of a masculine humanity from the feminine nature of Our Lady is a new creation. Again, just uh, taking, you know, you're just playing around with the with the concepts. All right. Well, with that, I think maybe we could call that a night and ask Father Joseph to finish us with a Hail Mary and a blessing. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. A Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, now Mother. At the hour of our death. May God Almighty bless you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you. I, I, I will see you next week. Could be great, yes. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. <laughs> See you. See you later.